Hi, I'm Dr. McFerrin with DM Explains. In this short lecture, I'm going to provide an introduction to the engineering design process, and we'll work through the first couple of steps. So I'd like to cover a little bit of design terminology. The first term to introduce is objective. The objective is the goal or purpose of a design. We also need to understand what a constraint is. A constraint is any aspect of a problem that limits the possible solutions. We have clients that we work with. This is who the designer is working for. We have the designer. In this situation, that would be me or an engineer, and that they are the person or people who solve the client's problem. And then there's the customer. You may notice that we have a client, which is the person who's actually responsible for paying for it, and the customer is the people who may use the solution. The client and the customer may be the same entity or they may be different entities. Let's talk about what the engineering design process is. The first step to the engineering design process is to define the problem. A problem is something that is presented to the designer by a client. Then the designer works to tease out what the actual problem is. In the process of defining the problem, the designer will then identify what objectives and constraints go into the design process. The second step in the engineering design process is to generate multiple solutions. Typically in this step, we aim to generate as many ideas as possible rather than focusing on the ideas being good ones or those that necessarily meet all of the constraints and objectives. The next step to mention is to gather information. This step is visited very frequently throughout the process. So before I move on, I do want to point out that even though I'm listing these steps in order, they do not always happen in this order and often they are revisited a number of times throughout the design process. In the gathering information step, you're going and getting information. That could be doing research. That could be doing literature searches. That could be running experiments in a lab and it could be a number of other ways to get information about the problem that you're trying to solve. The next step is to analyze and select. This is what we call engineering decision making. Once you have a group of possible solutions that more or less meet the objectives and constraints, the next step is to identify which solution is the best one and how you should move forward. The next step is to test and implement. So once you have chosen a solution, test that that solution will work the way that you think it will, um, build a prototype of it, test it, and then most likely what's going to happen is that you will iterate through these processes before you come to a final solution that is the product or service that is being delivered. So in a more graphical way, what we can do is we can show the design process in this way. We have those five steps but we've drawn a bunch of arrows in here to demonstrate that typically there is iteration and there is use of almost every step at, in different parts. And so these things are rarely done in order. When you redo a step, you're making improvements to the design. This is what we call iterating the design. We make it better by going through the process again. While we're doing this, we're documenting what we're doing. We're doing meeting minutes, photos, sketches, making sure that we know what decisions were made, why they were made. This applies to far more than just design problems, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's drill down on each of those steps. The first one I want to drill down on in this presentation is defining the problem. In this step, we are recognizing that there is in fact a problem and how we can identify it. Typically, the client is approaching the designer with the problem, and the designer is going to work with the client to determine what the objectives are and the major constraints are for this project. The designer then develops or writes a problem statement and determines what it means for the solution to be successful based on those constraints and objectives. Sort of looping back to Looping back to some terminology, a constraint is a design target that must be met for the design to be successful. The objective is a design target where more, or sometimes less, is better. 
In other words, you have a minimum acceptable threshold or a maximum acceptable threshold and you want to better that by having better designs. You can apply the engineering design process to many things in your life. So you can apply it to solving the problem of too many dishes on your counter. What is the problem? Is the problem that there are a lot of dishes? Is the problem that no one is cleaning up? And so on. When I think about refining curriculum as a faculty member, refining the way that I teach a class, it is helpful to keep track of the changes I've made over time. It's helpful to figure out what the actual problem is, not what I'm being told is wrong, but rather what is the root cause problem. So this is helpful. We can use engineering design in very many aspects of our life. In fact, non-engineers will be able to recognize in successful engineers the application of the design process. Engineers are problem solvers. I will probably say this repeatedly, but an engineer is a person who solves problems to help others. What we want you to learn as an engineer is how to solve problems. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to apply the engineering design process. One example I give is when I was looking at graduate schools, I defined what my constraints were, what my objectives were, and then used those to make a decision about where I should go. I do this in other aspects of my life as well. Now, there are some pitfalls when it comes to defining the problem. The first is that sometimes clients propose solutions when they're posing the problem. Maybe they give you an example of something they could look for rather than saying what's the problem we're trying to solve. And sometimes the clients don't know what problem they're actually trying to solve. So an example, let's say the client says design a bridge that will get me from one side of the river to the other. When they tell you to design a bridge, they're actually giving you the solution in the problem. But what is the problem? The problem is that the client wants to get from one side of the river to the other. The problem is not build a bridge. The problem is design something that will get me from one side of the river to the other. So are there alternate solutions to a bridge? Of course there are. You could take a boat. You could build a catapult. You could implement something that helps them fly from one side to the other, a hot air balloon. So what we want is to identify what the objectives are to this problem. The first objective being that we want to safely cross from one side to the other. It could also be that it needs to support a certain amount of weight. So that would be a challenge for a hot air balloon. Say we want to be able to carry 10 tons across this. The, the load we want to carry is 10 tons. That's not likely to work with a hot air balloon. If we're running a ferry back and forth, does that impact how ships can go up and down the river? These are objectives that we could identify as part of the problem. And then, as I said, we have other solutions. Maybe you can think of others. Maybe you leave those in the comments below. Here's another example. Let's say we have a client who wants you to design and construct a device to launch peanut butter sandwiches to people in a stadium. What is the problem? Is the problem that they need to deliver peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? maybe on one level, but the problem may be that they just want something to entertain the audience. Are there some other solutions on a small or large level? Of course there are. Maybe you can come up with some and put them in the comments below. If we decide to move forward on the peanut butter and jelly launcher, we need to find out what the objective is and what the most important constraints are. So to write a problem statement, here's the form we will use. We'll start with a background explaining why the problem needs to be solved, and we'll finish with a sentence that begins design A. And in this sentence, we'll mention the primary objective and the major constraints. For example, entertaining and feeding crowds during events for which there is some downtime, like a basketball game, is a means to control the behavior of the crowd. Maybe hockey is a better example. Sometimes t-shirt guns are used to good effect for this. What we want to do is design and construct a device that will launch peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to people in the stadium. 
What that leaves out is maybe some major constraints. Maybe I should write it differently and say design and construct a device that will launch peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to people in the stadium without damaging the sandwiches or injuring others. It tells me why the problem needs to be solved and what the specific problem is. How do we define success for the peanut butter and jelly project? When working with the client, you could figure these out, but the sandwiches shouldn't be squished, people don't get hurt, the device can be targeted, and potentially others. The next part of the design process that we're going to talk about today is generating ideas. There are a number of recognized methods for groups to generate ideas for a design. We're gonna focus on exactly two. The first is brainstorming, and the second is the 635 method. In each of these methods, there are specific rules that should be followed to generate ideas. For projects that have many constraints, it's often useful when you begin to generate ideas to ignore some or all of those constraints because that'll give you more options. When you refine the ideas, you can adapt based on what the constraints are. So let's talk about brainstorming. Brainstorming is a classical technique. There are some rules. So the first rule is that we're going for quantity, not quality. That means that anything that is put out there goes on the board, it is an idea. Even if it's bad, no negative reaction comes from you. It is supposed to be a welcoming experience. To that point, we're deferring judgment of those ideas. We should not have single people dominating this experience. Of course, we can use a nice Dilbert cartoon here to illustrate exactly what I'm saying. In fact, we want to encourage wild ideas. We want the ideas to be crazy out of the box because that's how we actually land on innovation. We want to build on the ideas of others. So if someone has an interesting idea, is there something that you can add or take from that or learn from that to propose other ideas? It's helpful to be visual. Sometimes your ideas it's easier to draw them than to write them in words. Think of the ideas as a headline. Don't worry about the details. You're just going for quantity. We can focus in, refine ideas later. The big rule is that we want one conversation at a time. We don't want side conversations. We want one person to be allowed to talk. When they're done talking, then you can, and you converse about it, then you can move on to someone else. It's really important to stay on topic and so usually in brainstorming sessions it's good to assign one person who is going to sort of moderate. Maybe they can contribute their ideas but their whole goal is to say, all right, are we on topic? Can we keep talking about this problem that we're trying to solve? Now, the potential drawbacks are what I have already mentioned which is that certain individuals may dominate this process. To try to avoid that, you can implement rules about every you know go around the circle let each person contribute an idea before you come back to another person or give a put a timer clock on say all right you can contribute one idea every five minutes there's a, a number of ways you can sort of do that because there's a lot of chatter and it's this is generally a high energy loud sort of experience it may not be the most effective use of time and so a refined method is the 635 method. This is a technique that is designed to counter some of the downsides of brainstorming. So here it is. Let's say you have six people. This number can change. Six is a nice number. Each person lists three ideas. Then they pass those ideas on to the next person. The next person then will refine those ideas, not write new ideas, just give further refinement, drill down on that, those ideas, and then you repeat for four more times. So there's six people, we're writing three ideas, and then we're passing it around five times. In this method, it's a much more quiet affair. There is not shouting, no one's talking over each other. Everybody gets a chance to start with their own ideas, and those get to be refined five times by your peers until what you're left with is ideally six times three, 18 good ideas. 
then you can refine and meet from there and sort of rank those ideas and eliminate ones that don't really work. But this avoids the issues of time wasting and having to stay on topic and the potential for people to dominate the discussion. So it's a really good alternative. If you wanted to do this with fewer people, it would change those numbers. So instead of being 635, let's say it would be 332 for a group of three people. So a quick review of what we've done today. We have introduced the engineering design process as well as some terminology. And we have drilled into the first two steps, which are define the problem and idea generation. In the next video, I'm going to drill into the remaining three steps of the simplified design process. If that video is done, you should see a little eye in the corner right about now. Leave any feedback you have in the comments below. And thanks for watching.